just listen to Keatlin and Byron and the Dragon Ears. One of them long time songs where most of you know listen to this program will know, you understand, but it's one of them Jamaican, what you call it, rent a tile song, or if you want to say, Steppers song. Them big tune from them time there. So we're there with you. You know, then we the, 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 the big news, the big, big, big news, you know, is that a democratically elected president was deposed by a coup today by the military in Egypt by the people. It's a serious thing because democracy is where the president had declared, said, well, is that put him there? And if a democratic thing put him there, a coup should move him. But the voice of the people move him still. The same people who vote for him decides they don't want him again. And the military take over now. So that's our next problem now. So America is in our next problem now. Because, see, Mubarak, who them did move also, was an ally of America. And now we see this brotherhood group, you know, where it's one of the biggest organized group in a them part of the world eh, of Islamic people was part of this movement. And now the people them decide, say, look, you know, you put me in a too much problem in a Rasta. We don't want to know again, you know. And them just demonstrate. Millions are demonstrate. Yet they have millions of demonstrate for him to stay. So it's a very serious time in the Islamic world yeah, right now. We don't know America because see vote that one, yeah. You know, but America is always in the, the meat of the matter every time you hear these things happen. You know, so you wonder is what is going on there you now. How is it that this thing does rise up so over less than well, about two years now, the the, 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 the whole leap what them call it, the Arab Spring. <laughs> Uh, them get a name, the Arab Spring, they spring up. And them say, democracy. We know one guy we are lead with for 30 odd years and we can't change him. And now them get one in less than two years, them change him. And now the military is there. So we're going to see what happened. We're going to see it pan out and see what going to become of it. This is Mr. Louis Farrakhan. You know, so people don't know that he did have a next name, you know, his name is Mr. Walcott. <laughs> Yeah, if the name is a Walcott. So here we go. Louis Farrakhan in I'm Diaz. You understand? This is Louis Farrakhan in I'm Walcott Diaz. <laughs> Louis Farrakhan. You know, my father was a Jamaican, yes. From a logical point of view, I bet they have married a woman who is uglier than you because you know, say, no man not go at her. You understand? So you sure are every time there. That is a logic. <laughs> I don't know if it works because no kill the woman ugly out there. Somebody want her. Believe you me. No kill the man ugly out there. Somebody want him. Yeah, so if you think he's, just pitch him out in the street and you will see. By the time you count one, two, three, a woman go with him. Likewise, a man go with a woman. We see that 
you know, we are listening to the interview a while ago upon the, the entertainment buzz a while ago. And we are saying, one of the reasons why I'm not really like interview politicians is because politicians always say the right things. They always say the right things. Believe you me. <laughs> Coming from the man Ernie Wilson, yes, long time artist them, yes, still they about to sing, give you some classic music in them days there. Say we have to put on this junior because we have somebody outside that show we are dope here. So we're gonna put in, put on this junior and go look for this dope here outside there. Yeah, all right. Here you go. Light charmers. Tell you that tell us. Sorry about that, you know. I'm gonna show me a demon outside there a while ago. I tell you say something wrong with my eye, you know. Something wrong with my eye, Rasta. I'm gonna show me a demon and show me some things will come out of him. And I tell him if you go see doctor, but I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, I may bring it down for myself. <laughs> I may bring it down for myself, though, but I ask him for send a demon come show me that I can talk to him. I never tell him must go show me feel to have come out of them. We look like demon. <laughs> it's bad. The man said the the, the, the feel to him come out with a high. I try to show me say a demon come out of him belly for them t shirt. I must look on it. Maybe if Taku had it there, I would have it see too. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> we have a very important um, interview tonight, yeah? At 11 o'clock, our time. Oba Ayatunje from the African village in South Carolina. No, I will you might not know what it an Oba is or who a Oba is. Well, we have had the experience of going to the Oba of Bendel State in Benin. We go to him palace, the Oba Palace. The Oba is the what would I call the, the, the main spiritual person in a, that village. And the village is like the king of the village, really, but it's more spiritual. It's more a spiritual thinker from like the Yoruba tradition. I don't want uh, to put myself on the line and say Yoruba tradition, but I go and say it, Yoruba tradition. And the Oba is the spiritual guide, guide for the village. And first time we went to Nigeria, we actually met the Oba of Bendel State. So we want to interview the Oba of the Ayatunje African village in South Carolina. And there is a there is a community of Yoruba priests and priestesses and kings and queens that is in America. A couple years ago, we had the opportunity to go to, um, I think it was Texas, where we took part in this Yoruba, um, I, would, I don't want to say ritual, but Yoruba celebration. It was a beautiful celebration on the beach. You know, I mean, like, wonderful, wonderful. I mean, like, yes, it's hard to explain. Like, hundreds of people all dressed in white doing the African things, the in African traditions on the beach. All day, who was invited there. Now, we have been invited also to this village here in South Carolina. We want to interview the Oba from that village at 11 o'clock. And it is so sweet it's so sweet because them know Sayarasta. 
and them recognize the work, hear of the work, see the work, and them thing there, and always seen say the invitation is open, and they always, as I said, this is the second one now that I got come in contact with, where them send out an invitation for me to really come and visit this village. We want to also mention that there was a next village, Malake, um, this virgin who is in prison now. I think them gave him 100 years. He have a big, he did have a big um, village. And he was not the Uber, he was not none of them. He more deal with like extraterrestrial and human being origin outside of this. Malachi Yark, and I remember him inviting me to get an invitation. I was in Canada to come to the village. I think it was in Atlanta, him was where he really had this village. Well, the government of America locked him up and gave him a hundred years. I know the case still are gone because I can't to some tapes where I get all of it's like a trumped up charge by him relative. In relative, make the FBI use him and was able to bring a charge against Malachi Yark. But this Malachi Yark is a man who have enough book, some serious esoteric books, where them sent away over the years. You know, serious, serious esoteric books. Well, this village where we are telling about is a Yoruba village. And the one in a Texas as well as a Yoruba, and I know that you have ones who practice the Yoruba tradition in Jamaica. You know, we know of Lantonet Steins as a priestess. Remember Yeye Fini, who used to live in Jamaica, yeah? And we know of other sisters who really is part of that Yoruba tradition in Jamaica. Well, if people don't know about that tradition because we seem not to want to associate with our African roots. You see, we prefer to be Christians. Some people tell us, eh, Christianity is African. Christianity is not African. The idea and the concept come from Africa. But Christianity as we know it today is not African. It's a European invention. No matter where nobody wants to say, no matter who nobody wants to say, say whatsoever them say, Christianity is a European invention as it is and practiced today. The original thinkers, when it was conceived, was in Africa. But the practice that now perpetuates itself in the churches, both East and West, is of European origin. The whole concept and idea came out of that same place now that you see this, of this turmoil where millions of people is demonstrating where the Arabs now control, because there's more Arabs in Egypt than in Saudi Arabia. Ironically, and the whole of North Africa, the imposition of Islam for North Africa is unquestionable. The whole of North Africa is Islam from them time there, because one cannot forget the Moors of the North Africa, the Tuari people of Mali who embrace Islam, and Islam spread into Europe by way of these so-called Moors. And now we see Islam from Egypt to Mauritania, way down into Mali, to Senegal. I mean, deep, unbelievable. And they actually wipe out the traditional African spirituality that define Africa. And where, where, where the Arabs did not succeed, 
the Europeans succeed. So you have two traditions in Africa that almost wipe out the African spirituality. We are talking about Christianity and we are talking about Islam. None of them have the interests of African people at heart because the two, those two major religions not only devastate but also try to wipe out Africa and its cultural expression. And Yoruba tradition is one of them that we see growing in popularity amongst people who don't want to associate with Christianity and searching for an African redemptive um, religious practice. Them turn to Yoruba tradition. Especially the sister them. A whole heap of sisters in Jamaica right now choose the Yoruba tradition after examining even Rasta. A whole heap of ones even examine Rasta and say Rasta still maintain a certain westernized Christian practice and belief. So them turn to Yoruba tradition. So the Yoruba tradition, even though small in numbers, has gained popularity, especially amongst what would I call educated ladies, <laughs> educated sisters. A lot of educated sisters turn to the Yoruba tradition. So we have come in contact over the years with this Yoruba tradition that talks about the gods, the Orishas. The Orisha tradition is found in Cuba, Trinidad, Brazil. When it is in Cuba, them call it Santaria. And Santaria is mixed with what the Europeans bring and the African retentive element of the Yoruba tradition. And IT, where we have voodoo, where we live people free that. Voodoo is part of that whole tradition, African spirituality. So we have voodoo in Haiti, we have Santaria in a Brazil and in a Cuba. And the Orishas represent and symbolize the different gods that help to satisfy human beings' connection with the divine. We are scared to go into these things because of our Christian upbringing where our Christian upbringing does not allow us to venture into other aspects of our essence, of our being. So what we do when we don't understand it, and most of us don't want to understand it, we demonize it. We demonize it because we are ignorant and they tell us that ignorance is bliss. So we forfeit a lot of ourselves in order to sustain and maintain European concept of what is supposed to be our reality and what is not our reality. So we embrace European reality and we define ourselves in that reality at the detriment of our self, no confidence in self. And most of the time it's because we don't know it. And when we know it, we demonize it. You see, so Obia is demonized. Even you hear whole heap of the songs them where Rasta sing in a Jamaica against Obia. And if you ask them what is Obia, you will hear that Obia as something where people use against people. Of course, you can't use people get Obia against people. They know you're Christian and read Psalms against people. Who can read Psalms like Christian against people? 
Anything can be used for good and anything can be used for bad. But Obia is always bad. So Obia is outlawed in Jamaica. But the celebration of the European understanding of supernatural, we could call it supernatural then, is not outlawed. So if you start to go into the, the, the intricacies of Christianity as it relates to the supernatural, it is okay to do that. If you are talking about the sacrifice of a human being, it is okay to do that inside of Christianity. Because God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that sacrifice, that blood sacrifice, that continue even in the major religion of denomination, the Roman Catholic say, when the father hold up the cup and him take the Eucharist and him say, eat, this is my flesh, and him take the wine and him say, drink, this is my blood. And at the point of entering your body, the dogma is that Transform itself. Ask any Roman Catholic priest and Muta tell you this. Ask any Roman Catholic priest in Jamaica say Muta said this on the radio. Say, big educated Roman Catholic people believe say when them drink the wine and eat the Eucharist or put the Eucharist by them tongue and enter them body. It, be, it transform itself into the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. So, why don't you go out there, find a Roman Catholic priest or a person of theology, and ask them, tell them, say, I hear this dumb idiot boy up on the radio talk about Roman Catholic when them eat, when them take the Eucharist, it transform itself into Jesus' flesh. I choose her and hear what them say to you. It's true, say, when you don't drink the, the wine, when you believe they turn to the blood of Jesus, hear what I'm saying. Hear what I'm saying. Or if you want to go and investigate the dogma of the Roman Catholic Church and find out what I say a while ago and find out if what I say is just a little mad rat that the radio said. I said again and I will say it again that we have demonized our own traditions demonize it to the point of rejecting it to the point of scorning it and take up other people's understanding of their religious practices and we don't see it as weird that is the problem with it we don't see it as weird when the father tell you say blood sacrifice is a human being that is offered up for the salvation of mankind when Abraham take him only son to prove a pint that God will prove a pint. And then him cut the lamb. Because in those days they used to sacrifice. They used to have blood sacrifice. They used to have blood sacrifice amongst a holy part of the nation. They used to be the Israelites. There are certain people who actually believe say, if you drink the blood of a warrior, the strength of that warrior will become part of you. Nobody say them thing they as weird. Nobody say them thing they as strange, especially when you come from this part of the world, especially when you're a black person, especially when you hear about African traditions and you hear about Obi and Voodoo. You say, Lord God, me can't bother them thing they, a devil thing them that, a devil. What make Voodoo a devil thing, but the Roman Catholic Church that tell you that when you drink the wine is the blood you drink. And when you when you take the Eucharist is the flesh you eat. What man of thinking is that to place upon human beings in at this time, yeah. Nobody goes around the place saying, Me no cannibal, me not eat no flesh and drink no blood. 
You know, come tell me foolishness. And yet, see them have all ashes of right cross by your face during, during um, Ash Wednesday. How, how people not see that as primitive, unintelligent superstition. But the way of the African is always seen as primitive, ignorant, dark age. And whatsoever else you can find, that is derogative to define the African way. And there's a lot of this way in Africa. I have seen a lot of them. Because Eti, voodoo, um, ceremony, just to experience that. Because we see it. We see it. And we ask about weird. Them are the things, European are the things, but when them do the thing, it's a terrible demonic thing. But when Rome do the something, it's an upliftment and a joy. When them tell you that one man dead for your sin, therefore the world should not have no sin anymore. Because him sucking all of that unto himself and died for you. Yet still, we die every day. Every day we die in Jamaica. Every day we die in Jamaica. Especially in Jamaica. We die every day. But the Pope give you hope. At least two Popes down, three Popes down. The Pope say, Evna and El is not a physical place. We did not know that already. But we couldn't go tell the people them. Because, because when we tell the people them that them say a fool fool thing we are talking about because man like me I go down at the bottomless with I'm burning fire. And we don't show you the origin of how that did come about. So we we'll continue the journey this week again now. I never know so much people that listen to the program last week. <laughs> Believe you will be up to today. Up to today, people are calling about the program last week and ask me if I'm going to continue this week. Yes, we're going to continue this week on the basis that we want to talk about, we want to talk to an Oba, as we just mentioned, the Oba. The Oba of the Oyotunje African village in South Carolina. And then, after we've done that interview, we want to continue this, where we see as an enlightenment in relationship to African spirituality and how we degrade it and downgrade it because we are so engrossed in white supremacy and what Europe had to offer us. Even though in the Bible, the Bible sanctions slavery. Slaves must be obedient to their master. Where a woman must not speak in the church. That nature teaches that a man should have not have long hair. Does not nature teach you that? That a man mustn't have long hair. The woman must not talk in the church, but a man must talk for her because the man is the head of the woman as Christ is the head of the man. We don't see those things as downgrading. But when it comes on to African retentive elements of our being, all of it is demonized. Every part of it is demonized. You hear Rasta every day. I talk about Isla, this, them, no one, Isla, this, that, that, and Hobia, this, and all them things. Because they are so engrossed in Julio Christian mindset. That the Julio Christian mindset does not allow you to transform your ideas into African spirituality. Now we are going to say it again. Christianity is not African spirituality. Christianity was adapted. Christianity was adapted. No Christian, no Christianity never there. Ethiopia 
before according to the Bible, the Ethiopian get baptized by this eunuch. And then it transform itself into Ethiopia. The ancient, the most ancient of all the countries. And of Ethiopia take it and make it become Coptic. Because all of them think they are transform itself from Egyptian Coptic church. Before the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, it was the Ethiopian Coptic Church. It is the Ethiopian, it is the Coptic Church that put the, the crown on his majesty. It's the Coptic Church that put the crown upon his majesty. And when we look upon how Ethiopia as an ancient country allow a peripheral culture to overshadow and overtake for them culture is a serious thing. Because we declare Ethiopia as the most ancient of all the countries in Africa. Yet still, a peripheral thing that is happening in a little part of Northeast Africa, known as Jerusalem, become the dominant force in the historical reference point of Ethiopia. When Ethiopia existed thousands of years before what we call the Salomonic dynasty. If the Salomonic dynasty, if the Salomonic dynasty is what Ethiopia used to define themselves in history. So the Ethiopian history in Ethiopia start when a woman by the name of Makeda visit Salomon. How did that happen? How did that become the beginning and the sole authority of Ethiopian history? Because the church perpetuated. No Ethiopian youth working in Ethiopia know anything about Ethiopia before Salomon. Yet still we are told that Ethiopia existed thousands of years before that Egypt become the child of Ethiopia. And the traditions of Ethiopia is what spill over down the Nile into Egypt and become what we call now Kemetic understanding of knowledge. But guess what now? Guess what now? We demonize Kemetic understanding of knowledge too. We know why you're not about Kemet or what them call Egypt. So they start talking about Oris, Isis and all these things. People tell you, say, boy, right now, them thing there, we don't have them talking about Jesus we are working with. Jesus Christus. Not realizing, say, Jesus Christus is a Greek configuration. Not even Ethiopia, there's a word for Jesus. Because the Greeks, them rely upon the, the, the Ethiopians rely upon the Greek word to define and authenticate them understanding of them Savior. How did an ancient country as Ethiopia allow the Greeks, the Greeks to define them spirituality in relationship to the name of them Savior? How did that happen? So I have a bridge named Martin Plano. Martin Plano have a very important reasoning that him always revert back to as a man who sit down with Eilis Lassie and talk to Eilis Lassie. And Plano say, Rasta need a new faculty of interpretation. Go look for the word faculty, faculty, and so it mean. And go look for the word interpretation, and so it mean. But Rasta need a new faculty of interpretation. We have to find that way that can sustain us for a longer time in our African essence. Other than just regurgitating what our slave masters taught us. And now we hold fast to it and make it become a part of us. 
We must reach higher than that now, based upon the experience that we have. And we are lose it because we're into the belief and not into the experience. Because most ones know where we say, wrote the players. We claim Rastafara. It's in the belief them is. them not even into the, the experience, the cultural expression and them thing there. That get lost into the belief. So soon you will have no more cultural expression of Rastafari. Anybody now will say, me is a Rasta. Me not have to show it. Rasta is an article thing. <laughs> I know this is about a one, you know. Rasta is more than article. Rasta is more than article. The greatest part of Rastafari is the cultural expression of Rastafari that define Rasta in at this time, yeah. Because if it wasn't the cultural expression of Rastafari, you should have just stuck in our belief like Christian, because Christianity don't have no culture. Christianity don't have a defining cultural expression. More than them say, I believe in Jesus. I am baptized in the name of La, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. That is a saying, a belief system. It don't have no cultural expression. When you look upon Rastafari in its early days, it had a cultural expression that define it. Most ones know what they say them is Rasta, but within the cultural expression, it is not there. A man feels a reggae is a Rasta cultural expression. Rasta, Rasta use reggae, but reggae is not Rasta. You see, and a whole heap of the times, reggae seemed to almost far. We don't want to make anyone feel no way, but we don't know no other way to say it. I was going to say it. Sometimes reggae make Rasta diminish in a, its relevance. This is the cutting edge. Pepsi invites you to see Beyonce live. The cutting edge. And I refer we also go through the, the idea of African retentions in our life. Where we don't want to um, come to grips with our Africanness. And anytime we see our Africanness, we reject it as something bad and demonic and all them things. Yet still, the same thing come to in other ways. The same thing come to in other ways through the European spectacle. And we accept it. We accept it to the point of almost wanting to die for a lie that has been told for centuries. You understand? And we say Islam penetrate Africa, not Africa, to the point where the Africans them now reject them Africanness. You know, time and time we talk about the story with the taxi driver in a Senegal way. When we ask him name, him say, him give me a, him give me a, a, a Arab name. And I say, so where you Senegal is there? And tell me, I say, so why you give your African name for Senegal, for, for Arab name? Him say, because him is a Muslim. And that is the same thing with Christian too. More time, anytime people hear you have African name, they say, Lord, what kind of name that? The first thing about tell you, they say, Lord, what kind of name that? Then why hear something like Tony or John. Or James or Peter. You see it called them can't bother call this them long word, you know. Oh you fool me and had they fooled me and these kind of names. But we need to return to our roots. We need to return to the root, you know. So all of them all of them things there is to get your faith understand how important it is for relate to your Africanness. Tired of taking the blame, might as well play the game. We used to live at Waterloo Avenue there one time, and a brethren said, He wants to sell with some things, some African print from Africa. When we used to have the shop, I'm telling him, to Come to my house, 
Come make me look on this. Make me look on the clock, there, man. The African come at my house and a wife. When you see when I'm looking at the house, I'm saying, nah, come in there. <laughs> I kid you that. This is that, though. This is a serious thing, you know. The African say, nah, come in at the house. Because we have too much African things in there where represent, you know, the things where Ima run from. You understand? The mask and the, you know, them kind of weird. Them, them really kind of not really want it. So I say, why are you afraid of that? Him say, well, him is a Christian. Him say, he's a Christian. Me say, Oh, so you're a Christian, so you're free of the things them where you come out of. Huh? That's, that's how deep it is. You know? To me, that's that's some deep shake, 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 shake. So trust me, that's deep, man. That you see your culture and reject it to the point where a man where the we over the other side of the world embrace the art of these spiritual... Um, Artistic expression, artistic expression. And you're just afraid. You're not coming out of your house. <laughs> it's like, wow. You know, that's something else, man. That really something else. A serious thing. Cutting edge. We still have weird pun. The Oba. Hello. Hello. All right, blessed. Blessed. Alafia. 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 I love you. Oh, happy. happy to be back again on the cutting edge. Uh, give thanks, man. You know, I was I was trying to figure out what was happening because I, I left two numbers and I wasn't hearing the call coming in, you know? Yeah, we're busy. We're real busy here, so yes, she yes. just got the email, so she just has been on the internet all day. Okay, so, um, you know, we're just trying to sensitize the people them about the, the tradition of this African village. I just want you really enlighten the Jamaican listener and who you are, what is this African village all about, what is the spirituality that defines the village, and so on and so forth. Just, I'm going to just allow you to speak. Certainly, certainly. I'll be happy to. First of all, let me say, Olodumari uh, Agbewao, in the traditional Yoruba language, we say, may uh, the heavenly divine carry us all, the one who is responsible for all things. Uh, carry us all and continue to support our every effort. I am His Royal Majesty Oba Adejibe Egunjobi Adefumi. I am presently the king of Oyotunji village and the Yoruba people of North America. I was born here in Oyotunji village. Uh, my father was the first king of Oyotunji village. I was born, of course, to a royal household. And as a child, I was told, as a child, as in, in our culture, our traditional culture, our Yoruba culture, we then do a divination. We consult the oracle to find out the destiny of a child so that we just don't grow in the child left to his own devices and to figure it out itself. The heavenly divine, through the power of our ancestors, devised the oracle where we can consult and find that out. So that was done for me, and it was found out then that I was to be the next king of Oyotunji Village. I was, I've been the king now for eight years here at Oyotunji Village, and I had the opportunity to grow up in the only African village in North America. Oyotunji Village, which is spelled O-Y-O-T-U-N-J-I. Oyotunji means Oyo rises again. Oyo is actually a city in West Africa, in Nigeria. And when my father designed the village and first built it, he wanted to... Um, give it a name that gave it power. And he used the name Oyo, which uh, was the great Oyo Empire. King Shango. King Shango conquered, you know, three-fourths of West Africa and uh, empowered the Yoruba Empire and stretched it far, far, far. And uh, it was the height of uh, Nigerian governance, royal traditional governance and community rule. And so the village was founded in 1970, here in South Carolina Low Country, or as we call it here, the Gullah Geechee Nation. The Gullah Geechee are the people who uh, inhabit this land, the African descendants, because, you know, they were still bringing Africans to this part in South Carolina. Well, first of all, let me say, South Carolina is where some of the first Africans come to North America came to, and if not some of the first, plenty, 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 plenty Africans came to South Carolina. So most people you see that African or black in, the, in North America, in, in, in America, 
they have roots in South Carolina or New Orleans and those major ports. And so my father uh, wanted to build a place where African-American people can go to rediscover their roots. Simple as that, to rediscover their African ancestral traditions and culture. And so um, the story begins with my father's birth in December or rather October 5th, 1928 in Detroit, Michigan. He was from Detroit, and he grew up always being proud, or always told to be proud of his African heritage, no matter how light-skinned he was or no matter how nice his nose and lips was fine. His parents always told him, look, son, you're an African boy, and you're a descendant of royalty, you know. And so he remembered that. And so in 1959, he went to the island of Cuba to be initiated into the traditions of Africa. Now, I know lots of people say, well, the traditions of Africa is this, that, is devil worship, is this, that, and the third, but it is the tradition that supported us for thousands of years prior to anything else. Nowadays, we are black people in the diaspora in North America. We can subscribe to anything, you know. We subscribe to everything except our traditional culture, the culture that produced us, you know, which is, which is African culture, and African culture is based on people. It's based on community. It's based on future generations. It's not based on the bottom line. It's not based on profit. It's not based on money. So my father wanted to invent a place where African people can come and see the drums, the dances, the, the music, the language of their ancestors. Because it's never been done in North America. Ever since slavery, nobody even tried to do anything. Well, many people tried to do many things in terms of to, to make black people prominent in, in the diaspora, you know, Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, you know, all of these people. However, it was rare that someone came forward and said, you know what, we're going to do the things that we did the day they came and picked us up. We're going to go back to that day and begin to enact that life. So my father went to Cuba. He was initiated, came back to New York, and began to open up small temples. Because back in those days, there was no drums in North America. You couldn't find a djembe drum. You couldn't find a dashiki, you know. You couldn't find, and I'm talking about the 50s, like 1950s, like mid, middle 50s, like 57, 58, 59. You couldn't find none of these African things. So my father went and recreated Africa for Africans in America. So today when you see uh, African festivals in North America, you see people wearing dashiki. You see people with African drum. <clears throat> that was all a product of my father's work. You know, 125th Street in New York, where you find tons of African shops and things There's like Little Africa over there. You know, he began on 125th Street with small African parades, parades through Harlem with drums and dances. But soon he realized that they had to leave the city because he wanted to develop larger community. He wanted to build buildings because he was talking about Africa, you know. He was talking about Africa on the street alongside um, Stokely Carmichael, Martin Luther King, he was a good friend of Malcolm X, you know? And so many people wanted to know, but he realized that, look, if we want to stop talking about Africa and what Africa is and what Africa can do for people and all these types of things, he said, we have to go and design a place so people can see it and touch it and feel it and decide for themselves. So he came south and built Oyotunji. It was nothing, nothing but trees and, and forests and swamp land full of mosquitoes. So him and one of his wives, you know, because it, alongside every man is a powerful woman. And so she was there with him, and they slept in the woods and began to clear the land and slowly built the African village, recreated Yoruba culture to the T almost. You know, many, many uh, uh, scholars have come to Oyotunji, and they write about the village, and they find out that, wow, they have really recreated African culture to a high degree. And so today, Oyotunji stands as a monument to African culture in North America, you know, because you have all these different places, Greek town, Jew town, you know, all over North America. You have German town, uh, you got uh, Polynesian, Indian town, but you never find African town. China town. African people are the most dynamic people in North America. Yes. The most dynamic. Everybody want to be like us. If we turn our hat backwards, everybody turn their hat backwards, even the Europeans. Yeah. If we pull our pants down to our waist, everybody pull their pants off to their waist. You know, if we everything we do, people follow. So we have to begin to discover the, the culture 
Not the religion and all the, the religion, of course, too, and all the spirituality is necessary. But the culture that produced these people, these black people, why on Saturday night all black people have to go out to a party and dance or go to a dance hall? You know, so there, there are questions, and they can only be answered by investigating African culture, and that's what we do here at the village. We investigate African culture, and we implement it. Marriage, you know, we investigate how you get married according to African people. Do you just show up at the altar and you dun 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 dun, dun and it's a party and everybody comes and you, you may kiss the bride and you're married? No, 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 no. In African culture, it's different. You know, the parents have to be involved. They have to go out and, and help you discover the perfect mate, not based on looks or clothes or perfume, but based on its faculties. Can he build you a house? Can he buy you a house? Uh, uh, can he teach you things? Does he is he a responsible person? And then and then they go on and they, the, there's a bride price that's given. You know, a man can't have a wife in African culture just for free, just because you you bought her a drink. You have to spend more than that. And so again, we seek to recreate African culture and implement it into our lives. So, for instance, when somebody dies in the African village, there's certain African rituals that we do to bury that person because they are African people. It, 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 you know, why would we use Chinese ritual to bury an African? Why would we use Indian ritual to bury an African? Why would we use Mexican ritual? No, we use African ritual to bury an African because the Jews use Jewish rituals to bury a Jew. You see? And so... Here at Oyotunji, that's pretty much it. And uh, uh, we, we just continue to invite people in, universities, schools. Uh, many people come to Oyotunji to learn about the culture for 40 years now. And so today we're trying to do things to open up to a larger community. Because, you know, when you talk about Africa, people start to disappear and walk away and stuff. So, you know, now we're starting to open up the community with with certain types of events and things that can involve the community so people don't be so afraid of Africa. They come in and we have speakers that they can hear and people listen to the people speak. And, 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 you know, Muta Baruka soon come to Oyotunji and people are going to hear Muta speak and all of the other speakers are going to be here. People are going to have the opportunity to hear something different because now in America there's so much going on, people don't know what to do. They're losing their houses. They, the church can't help them. The mosque can't help them. And now... We're realizing that we have to turn to each other. That's why God put us on this planet, was to help each other, not to make a profit off of, yeah. <laughs> off of each other, you know. So, again, uh, I'll wrap it up by saying Oyotunji is a tiny African village in North America that's just like a small African village in West Africa. What you is can it? come to what Oyotunji, is it? What, we have what? celebrations, masquerades, dances, and so forth. What is the population there? What is the population of that village? Now, that's a good question. The population of Oyotunji right now is approximately 20 people. Okay. In the olden days, there were many people because when the village first started, all of the baby boomers, the people from the 60s, they were ready to do something, ready for a revolution, to make a change. And so they run to the bush to create this village. And so the 80s came and the 90s come. And now we're in the 2000s. The mindset is just a little different. You know, amongst our people, especially yeah. people my age, you know, 38, 39, and 40, they're more like, ah, you know, I got to have my career first. You know, I got to do my career as opposed to going to do something totally different than the system, which is Oyotunji African Village. Mm -hmm. Totally different from the system. You decide to go and live in the bush, create your own house, uh, and try to make your own money according to your culture and live the way you want to live every day. All right, so uh, yeah. give me a, give me a, like an everyday rundown of what would happen in the village in terms of sustenance, in terms of you know rituals, you know. Give me a kind of everyday thing. What what you actually do on a day to day basis at that village? Okay, Oyotunji is a very relaxed place. You know, anywhere you find Africans, they, they is a relaxed place. So we wake up in the morning. There is a drum that rings in the morning that uh, signals that everyone, so everyone knows that the flags are going up. So the first ritual in the morning is the raising of the flag, the Oyotunji flag, the African flag here in North America. We raise the flag every morning. The flag is red, yellow, and green with a black unk in the middle. And so 
Um, then uh, we go to work. We go to work on the village. Uh, you know, when you have your own village and your own land and your own town, every day is spent like you're a sailor on a ship. You have to tack this and fix that and tape this and nail that and screw this and put some stucco on this. So every day it's constantly fixing old buildings and trying to make new ones, you know. And so here at Oyotunji also, there's times when the elders meet throughout the week. The elders will sit down and talk about the week, things coming up and how we're going to work. Maybe one of the kids got in trouble uh, with, with the police or the law or somebody broke the village customary law and so the elders will get together and speak about it. And then after that, people are left to their own devices. You can stay in your house, you can do um, your own, maybe you have your business to run. People have businesses to run here, you know, uh, cultural businesses and also people come to Oyotunji to take tours every day. And so daily okay. people will come to Oyotunji and take tours. Okay. And then we will have big festivals whereby the entire community comes together to paint everything. They come together to, to put nails and stuff and get things together and get ready for the festival, you know. So okay. that's kind of like the community we try to build here at Oyotunji. All right, so in, in the festival, in, in, like, it's, it's all people in that part of South Carolina are just people who maintain the Yoruba tradition that come. <laughs> No, all people, all people. When, when the village first started, people were afraid. You know, anytime you talk about Africa, people get afraid. You know, I don't know why, because they steal everything from Africa, even the people. You know, but anyway, Oyotunji seems today, we seem to bring in all types of people. European people, you know, we have people traveling from Europe, you know, proper. We have people travel to Oyotunji from Japan. Um, Yale University writes about Oyotunji, Harvard University. They uh, write about Oyotunji. They have books on Oyotunji. And today we bring in a diverse group of people. And so here at Oyotunji, only people of African descent can live in the village proper. You know, and we make that known all, all the time. You know, Oyotunji is for the development of African people. And so European people can come and be a part of it and help develop it, but only African people can live and be initiated into the secrets of the society. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. All right. So, what what is it that is 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 Yoruba? What is your what is the define what is Yoruba religion or Yoruba spirituality? What is that? Well, um, when you say Yoruba religion, you see, African people never looked at religion as yes. something. We didn't have really a word for religion. Yes, yes. The word is like Isi in Yoruba culture. If Isi is religion. So Isim is not necessarily religion. It's more like uh, a way you're doing things because you've always done it that way, like a tradition. Yes. It's a, a tradition, yes. you know. So, so when you say religion, it's difficult because then the Yoruba people believe in the trees. The Yoruba people believe in the river. The Yoruba people believe in the forest, you know. So yes. all of the deities or the gods, as some people call them, yes. are based on nature. So they you know, like the river animal. goddess, you have the goddess of the river. They if you have a problem animism. in your life, in, in your love life, or in your, in, in your sexual life, or you have a problem um, making children or something, you will go to the river and wash in river water or use the river water. A priest will pray over it and do certain things, and then you'll be able to have it, you know. So African people didn't have religion where you went to pray and hope for something. No, you went to, your, to, to, the, to the deities of earth, the deities of the planet, and you told them what you want. You gave them the offering, and they gave it to you. So African people were about results when it came to "quote unquote" religion, and so. Um, but it's also it's more or less a culture too, because the culture, the religion are all one. And as my father taught us when we were children, he would always say, "Listen, the culture produces a religion. First comes the culture, and then the religion. Yeah, the religion yeah. is the celebration of the culture. culture so yeah, your Uba, religion and culture combined is the celebration of life." is a celebration of community because the Yoruba people themselves were some of the most highly technical people in West Africa. They had the most highly developed societies. And so that's why my father said we're going to follow the Yoruba because of the highly technical societies. Right. You see, so Yoruba, again, is not a religion. It's a yeah. culture. It's a way of life. Yeah, it's, a way, it's a way to, to, to live. Try your best to live in harmony with nature. Which, is, which really means get along with your fellow men. And so in Yoruba culture, we consult the oracle, Ifa. We have a system called Ifa, where we can find out what's coming ahead. 
You know, so if you're going into business, a person will go to Ifa and find out, well, what do I have to do to make this business successful? If a person is going to get married, they go to Ifa, ask the oracle, and the, and the oracle will tell them what they need to do to make this successful. And so, again, Yogi Bar Culture is a celebration of life, yeah. community, and trying to encompass throughout your entire life, trying to encompass all good character. It's yes. all about character definitely, in Yogi Bar Culture. Definitely, definitely. All right, what was happening... What is happening this weekend, I you know? Just oh, oh, this weekend <laughs> is, is going to be sometime here in Oyotunji Village. We are having the second annual Pan-African Grassroots Assembly, whereby we're bringing together African people of all different backgrounds. Because you know African people, we're the most diverse background people yeah. on the planet. You know, on the planet, we, we're in a bit of everything. We're in a bit of Judaism, Shintoism, Bintoism, Buddhaism, Shudaism, Imperialism, Undertoism, <laughs> Africanism, Europeanism. Socialism, communism. We're into all of it. So this weekend, we want all of those people to come forward. Show us what you have, because we have so much knowledge in our community. The grassroots assembly is an opportunity for all of those knowledgeable people, all of those poets, all of those drummers, dancers, all those people who have knowledge of African culture and knowledge of liberty, just pure liberty, to come to your Tunji and celebrate and get knowledge. That's pretty much and that's pretty much it. And have a good time in an African village in North America. We're going to have. Um, Dr. Umar, who is a child psychologist, he's going to be a keynote speaker of the event. We're going to have workshops and, and classes and presentations on African spirituality, presentations on male and female rites of passage, uh, presentations on women in African culture, women's positions in African culture, farming. We have a small farm here in the village where we'll be articulating composting and vermicomposting. The griots worked for the kings, you know. The griots were the voice of the kings because then they went out and articulated the history, the tradition, because the king is the keeper of the tradition. And the griots are the speakers of what's going on in the tradition, you see. So, and sometimes in Africa it's sad because after they take over European culture, a lot of the griots are just like cab drivers and people don't even listen to them because they just say they talk, 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 talk. But it's very traditional. And so very excited to have Muta Baruka in the African village. And we are going to, um, Muta will be speaking at the legacy dinner, the King's legacy dinner, when we uh, celebrate eight years on the throne here at Oyotunji Village. So very exciting weekend. There's going to be drumming and dancing, African dance classes, uh, capoeira classes, uh, tenting, and the like. So it's going to be a full weekend of many things happening. So I would say to anyone who's going to attend, just try to, you know, bring some water. So you can have plenty of water to drink, um, maybe a pair of boots and a pair of flip-flops because you never know the weather get wet and dry. So it's, it's just going to be a fantastic weekend. Yes. Okay, Oba, we are looking forward to it. And we say we give thanks for the moment and the time we you spend with this interview. Yeah, because we know, say, it's not Jamaican people don't know that aspect of them tradition, you know. Even though we yes, yes, I would love you know? to come back again. They have to invite me back another time. I would love to help and articulate the African tradition, you know, yeah, yeah. in my best way I can to yeah. help people understand. All right, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be back on that cutting edge again. It's been about, since, uh, ooh, 96, I was in Jamaica. Yes, ooh, time, it was about time. almost two years ago. Yeah, bless it, give thanks. One love, every time, or double. Oh, yeah. Things, say. Uh, we should have did a whole lamp and we kind of let it go in many ways. Because we, as we did that say, we demonize the African way and whole lamp and the periphery. 
that was turned and twisted and bended and shaped and thrown at us in our slavery mind. And now we will arm on it like we think that we're going to save we. And the more we will arm on it, the more we see say, we life become meaningless in a society that gives no credence to the sacredness of life. And we come with something other than, and it would appear that the thing is like an anaconda, just wrap around we and squeeze we. So we talk about the African way and people, most people know why I hear about that, definitely. The phone I ring. The phone I said. The phone I said, definitely. Yes. Good, 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 good night. Good night. Um, how do I go about getting um, the thing that you said, at the beginning of cutting edge? You mean teach your children, eh? Mm-hmm. Well, I may have it, you know, you'd have to get it from me. Can you have it? And, you'd have um, to call me up the, here and get it. What about the, the, the interview that, um, um, the, the one that I had last week, um, with that, that documentary? How do I go about getting it? As oh, the, 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 the Satan thing. Mm-hmm. And that you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The of Satan. Um, yeah, they both are there. They both of them are the ones. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, oh, you don't get it now. You don't forget it from me. Or uh, maybe you can't find it on line. Oh. Because most things, no, you can't oh. find it on line. That's why we love play things, I you know, to make people go on line and investigate certain things. I think you can't get it on line, though. Believe you me. Uh-huh. A long time you have it, but, you know, usually nowadays you can't go on all certain things and Google it and you get it. You know what I mean? Really? They can't give me a specific... I think it's uh, named the history of... Well, call it Lofita in the history of Satan. History of Satan. Yeah, it's named the history of Satan. Um, which, 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 which engine, which engine to search? Maybe don't know the history of Satan. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, you know. And the, the other one before, um, when you start with the children, I just say, um... I mean, have that, 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 yeah, I mean, just get it, all right, here we go, get it, get it, get it, um, get the operator your email address, let me see if I can send it to you. Okay, all right, I'm going to hang up and give it back. Yeah, right. man, give thanks. All right, sir. Yeah, me I tell you, so the program last week, me never know, I mean, well, not that I never know, because we really do it for make people go investigate certain things, and Really and truly, we see that the people are investigating the thing. That's why it gives you encouragement to continue in the vein and don't change what we are doing. You understand? Just that. Yes. Mother. Yes. Blessed. Yeah. Yeah. Blessed yourself, Mother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, you're probably weird, uh, yeah, you know. No, man, bless you, man. You say, you say, all right, I'm something, man. You say, no, we are silent. Um, yeah. Then I you know, say Muta, and then I say blessed. So we me to say no. Are you for say what you say? All right, sir. Um, what me I say? If I, if you say uh, a man die for your sin, right? Mm. And then in you know, this time, I know they must say people still have sin, people still have sin. So how can a man die for your sin? Right? And, and you still have sin? Yeah. A big question that. Because now I tell you that thing. My sister, a woman, uh, got courage and thing, right? Mm. And. Before she started to go to the church and things, you know? Mm. You just saying Jesus and doing things, you know? Mm. Now I was talking to her and I said, Yo, Sam, you ever listen to Muta yet? And you know Muta talk about? And she always said, Muta, Muta talk too much, man. Yeah, so I listen to man, man. You know that I'm going to radio for the talk now? <laughs> All right, well, I know. You know what I'm saying? Talk, chat, can't too much. You know? Mm. Now you just have to do every day a chat. Mm-hmm. All right, Muta. Mm. Right now, we just understand the left college, you got excellence to come to college or whatever, right? Yeah. And so she already have been here to have been my brother. Mm. She, she left college two years now. She spent four years four year over the day. Over, over Excelsior? Yeah, I do business. Mm. And she get her service ticket. That's how what day she just get her service ticket. Mm. She left the two years now, you know. Mm. And she just get her service ticket, what, what day, right? Mm. Yeah, she passed her everything. Yeah. All right. No, me and I are talking, me I say, what do I say, I know some Buddhist thing. Buddhist thing, Buddhist thing. But the Jesus thing, where we should use that with God's yeah, prayer. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, I have yeah. to understand, so she not really do the thing, she should have prayed at different places, isn't it? Mm. So I say, what do I pray? She have prayed 
Aku meeting si aku ibu tak biasa saya buat. Macam saya belum. Aja biasa aja biasa. So si dia biasa saya yang tua aguan. Bukan mikir believe in a one thing. Bukan oh aman si dia si yang sin. And then the worker tell us you still are sin. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, you know what I'm supposed to wipe out. You supposed to wipe out. So we don't know if where you are facing upon that. You only that me I say where you are say. Sin supposed to wipe out. Yes, it's supposed to wipe out. That me I say. Right? Cause it's the blood, it's the blood that save you, you know, you know, the blood, yeah, the blood that shed from Calvary <laughs> Cross that's supposed to save you. So, yeah. what am I trying to do now is reinvent the blood <laughs> through wine and mm, um, through Trinity and all these things, yeah. Bread and all these things, eh? Yeah, bread and fish and all yeah. these, yeah. Most of first time I call it still, yeah. Ah, well, give thanks, man, but we know you're listening for a long time. Yeah, we have to, man. We know you're listening for a long time, man. Yeah. yeah. That all your sister, that all your sister, though, good all start listening. You know, you know, you come from now, and my brother make me start listening to you. Mm. So, me, I say, your, your, your sister, where you say, just went, just go to college and come back, and maybe she start listening to you. Motor, she are listening to you. Right now, right now, my car, I say, I'm just a motor, we are listening. Motor, I just have my car, no. I just have my first time, my car, no. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm a car, I'm a car, I'm a car, I'm a car, I'm a Yeah, yeah. Really yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Give, give thanks, go. Bridget. Give thanks. And then we say, um, I bring more this, Zin. Bring more. Yeah, I'm up in there. It does. make no difference to me when you tell me your name, you know. Make sure that. Just go on, man. It's a year of a year. All right. Blessed, man. Blessed. Yes. Yeah. Um, where were you there? That's why we don't like take the call if we attack. That's some serious deep talk, you know, which can be all just miss the point when we don't bring more, but. We are continuing the journey within the level of understanding how them twist we and turn we and take we out of our Africanness that now belief become the order of the day. Because you have someone where I say, no, you know, me know this and me know that, they don't really know it, you know. Mm-hmm. Knowledge is evidence. Even though you have a man who tell you, say, well, it's Paul said. Faith is the substance of things hope for and the evidence of things not seen. No, me did love that statement there, you know. Believe you, me, you know. Me did love that statement there and me start to sit down and dissect it and dissect it and me I say, faith is the substance of things hope for. And then I say, but faith is not substance. You know, substance is tangible. And the evidence of things not seen. So you must say, fear is evidence. Fear is not evidence. Fear is not evidence. Knowledge derives from evidence and dissecting the statement. It's nice we say it still. It's nice we repeat it, you know, in a level of consciousness. You repeat it, you feel good. You know, fear is the substance of things over and evidence of things not seen. You understand? You know, question it because you say, well, it's so nice, it's so philosophical. Yes. Cutting edge. Yes, Mota. Listen. Yeah, that's why I don't, that's why I don't love to learn them walk in feet and not by sight. Yeah. Yeah, this, this, this thing here with the blood, I don't call the blood. Trans, transubstantiation. Yeah, and, and the, the real presence. Yeah, the Eucharist is the, is the little thing where they put by your tongue. Yeah, yeah, you could bread and thing. Yeah. Uh, but, I uh, him, you remember Henry the year to then say he was a wife him or something? Yeah, and him and kill some of them and then go turn Anglican. Yeah. In, in, he in legalized all of that, you know. Yeah. In 1539. Anglican Church, yeah. Yeah, and I have a thing called the uh, of Six Articles. Yes. And one of the articles was that you have to believe that, 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 um... It transformed transform, transform itself in your body. It was miraculous to change into the body of the blood of Christ. Are intelligent people today believe that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and if you, know, you if you start to tell them some things where you believe in the African spirituality, them say a foolishness, so you can't go believe them foolishness uh, there. Even the same name where you talk about the African name, them. Yeah, get them full, full name the yeah, 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 you know, they want you about John and Tom, Peter uh, and Paul. Because what the Christian is the essential substance. Yes. Change, but the outward property not change. Change, yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah, yeah, things, yeah. You know? yeah man. And, and, and all that, all them things that never done at the beginning. Yeah, not talking about that. Most people don't question it neither. Mm-hmm. They yes. accept it right. through faith. And then I am to the party place. I'm here, I'm going to sing, say, 
Why this is my evil. I said, but, but brethren, if you read your Bible, you know, you die, you know, you can't go to heaven. Mm. I'm even full already. Yeah. And he said, well, me I go, me say, no, if you read your Bible again, you will see the Bible. I show you, say, you're going to the New Jerusalem. In a, in them got enough people I've already. You're going to the New Earth. Yeah, yeah. Where am I going to make again? So one, that, one lady take me out, no, and he said, I said, I need to come in church and make him teach me because I don't understand the Bible. But then I tell you, you. I say, mm. if I don't understand the Bible, tell me something because he said, I need to come in church. I said, I come past me, I go like me. First question yeah. I go ask him, how come you have two questions? Yeah. Genesis 1 and Genesis Well, are two different people are write it. You know, see it. But it's to the one of the first Man of the first thing, the last thing he make, I want to tell you, say, man of the first thing he make. Yeah, yeah, that means that two people are right, two different so, No, but why is it, why is it contrary? I tell him, say, no, it's not contrary because this, and he start going or something, he say, but that still not answer the question. Well, you hear what them try, though? Them try cut out them food for fit the shoes, you know? Ah, every time. Every time they cut I, out the food for fit the shoes. And, that, and, and as a matter of fact, that's why the first story about the, 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 the seventh day when created, you know, the, the sixth day mm. when created. You know, because them say, and even for the seven days, I'm about Sabbath. The ma- then say, he finished work for the seven days. That don't mean say he never work. Mm. He finished his work for the seven days, then he rest. So if I start work on Wednesday, I can rest on Tuesday. Sabbath no must be Saturday or Sunday. And and, and, and the reason that story comes in is because when time I'm in the exile, the same year, the how much year exile mm. of Babylon, mm. the, 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 the Jews won't come into the church to them synagogue and forgive them tithes and things. So the priests they may not make no money. Mm-hmm. So they write that little story because it is proven, you know, you know the, 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 um, what them call them, what them find. And, and, and um, Ibla, and Ibla, the scrolls. Yeah. The one that is Genesis 1 was written 300 years yeah. after the first the Adam and story. Yeah. But then we we'll put in that to tell the people, well, if God has responded the seventh day and God say you have to do this, mm. no, 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 must respond the seventh day and God no work and come at the synagogue. You go at the synagogue by taking a bus where a man at work. Mm. Yeah, encourage yeah. a man to drive you go down at the, the ah, church. Yeah. And then you know, hire people to cook for them and do everything ah, with them. Right. Then, uh, that means, uh, that means, uh, <laughs> so, uh, that's a thing. That's a thing. Anyway, we're going to move on now, Bridget. We're going to move. All right. Yes. <laughs> well, until it's eight, one minute past twelve, you know. Brothers and sisters, this is Jai. Join us with respect for our national anthem. Let us stand and defend this one. Peace and love. Thank you. Eternal Father, bless our land. Who guide us with thy mighty hand. Keep us. This is the Cotton Edge and RFM. You know, we talk about culture and the expression in a Jamaican or Rastafari develop a cultural expression that define Rastafari. And part of it is what we call now the spirituality with defined way in terms of saying Eilis Lassie and after saying Eilis Selassie, and God, this is very important, we never just stop at saying Eilis Selassie, but over the years, we develop a way. And we're going to say a way because whenever you ask Rasta, but just like them bridging a while ago when him say Yoruba tradition is not a religion, 
And I agree with him because the reason why I say religion is to get the expression where I get from him. Because I didn't really actually want him to say what him say by him own mouth. So I asked him the question to get that response. So when you look at Rasta and say, Rastafari, um, to tell me about your religion, the first thing the Rasta tell you is, Rasta is not a religion, you know. Well, most Rasta, most Rasta. I know 12 tribes now, you tell them about religion, they don't really want to lick it. They say, religion, yeah, Rastafari religion. All right. The Rasta man say, Rasta is not religion, you know. Rasta is a way of life. So right away, you know, he might tell you, Rasta is a cultural expression. If you don't know what culture means, culture is way of life. <laughs> yeah, that's that. No. Rastafari come with calabash and crocus bag with ital food and herbs and locks and these things. You see, so within the tradition of Rastafari, they respond to colonialism and slavery is seen highly lassie and tried in a certain way. Now, a group come and redefine Rasta. Because we have the name, 12 tribe. 12 tribe come and redefine Rasta in a certain way. That Read the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. And within reading the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, you can now see what you is all about as a Rastafari. So, you start to accept that and... You see, say, yeah, all right, so you read it, so what else is there, though? After you read it, what is it? Because you could only do that in a church. You know, you come out with where you think, you believe, you believe that, and you believe that, and you have faith in that. But you have a group of Rasta where him gone beyond just reading it, him gone beyond living a certain way, a certain tradition that is that they define Rasta. Like how the bridge them don't have more crocus bag and calabas still. You understand? That make it unique. You have certain one at all, no, him doing that. He must say, why not that? He think uh, that, him say, you do have a dread to be Rasta. Because Rasta is an inborn concept. Just like Christianity. Of course, Christianity is an inborn concept. That make no difference. Because you don't have to say, if, if Rasta is an inborn concept like Christianity, you don't have to say Rasta. Because if, uh, what he has said is that, Ayla Selassie is, 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 Jesus Christ is the personality of Ayla Selassie. It means uh, Jesus Christ must be greater than Ayla Selassie in that vein. So you don't really have to say Ayla Selassie. Then you don't say Jesus Christ. You know what I see? Because the, the important point in Jesus Christ revealing himself in the personality of Ayla Selassie, it means that Jesus Christ is the greater aspect. Therefore, there will never be a time that Jesus Christ is not revealing himself in the personality of people. So I listen to say it's just the, the what we call the, 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 the outward physical manifestation of someone of 2,000 years ago. And if that body is no more, it means that that one Jesus Christ can reveal himself again in someone else. So the idea of Eilis Selassie would be null and void if you all and pan Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, the the the, the all in and Jesus Christ don't lead you to a cultural expression. Because it's not defining itself in no African tra- tradition. It it identifies itself in Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So you have a faith, you have the evidence of things not seen. I mean, say you're not seeing it, even though you say it's evidence, which kind of ironical that this is an evidence, but you can't see it. So when you look at the whole faith-based understanding, you say, but Rastafari must be more than just faith, because we can't go now, because if Rastafari is a faith, then I just achieve you go say Christianity. Because it don't make no difference. It don't make no difference. It don't make no difference if you keep holding on upon the, the Jesus Christ. 
Christianity that me people know I say why I know I know I know European Christianity my deal is my Ethiopian Christianity. What is the difference between Ethiopian Christianity in the context of reading the Bible? There's no difference. I see them Bible them using in Ethiopia. You know, as a matter of fact, them me told you say the holy mountain of Zion. And when you say a woman in there is, is and when you say a woman mentioned in it, it's a hmm. So when when I say is that there is something that when Rasta come on here and develop, did make Rasta a unique entity in a Babylon, according to what man I say. There was something vocal and living wise, the liberty, the liberty of Rastafari. Is where make Rasta unique in a this neo-colonialistic white supremacist system. And me I say non-apologetically that it diminish because we all are upon the Judeo Christian mindset so much. That a thing people think like a calabash is of no importance or significance. I'm not telling you where right now. Oh, that I go save you. <laughs> it's like when we're in the organization and we are talking about title food, I'm say, boy, we are preach food doctrine. And we are saying, but the food doctrine is part of a Rasta develop in the cultural expression that define Rasta. So if you're going to use now the Bible to negate something that the farmer slaves develop, in this colonial system, as or no, and then say, is a doctrine you develop. Of course, it's a doctrine you develop. You have develop a food doctrine because you know, say, the food in a Babylon, according to where we say Babylon, going to poison away. So we develop a food habit where we say, watch, I know, a high tall food we want, you know, that means we have no synthetic, no process, nothing. We we'll just try plant our own food. Most Rasta youth. When them just start side rasta, they want to go to hills, go plant food and everything. That is a Rastafari cultural expression that get lost. When a man tell you, say, you yeah, deal with food doctrine. Because everyone that we know have to go to this food doctrine. Where the Rasta man, the ancient Rasta man, up in the bush, we can't read. And all him get up and do is looking at the sun ball, eat ear and water, and yarn houses continually through the inspiration of experience. Him develop a certain Ivar standing of the fullness of iration, and him just keep yanting that. And the eyes is go out there, and the more him yant it, is the more him experience things that him couldn't actually get if him did just sit down and I read. Because once him sit down and I read, him go get the same faith based understanding, like where the European them give him. Because you can't come out with nothing else. You can't come out with nothing else. You could have twisted and turned it a little more. You could have twist round Jesus a little more and bring it round a little more. It's the same Jesus you ever get. You could have blacked it a little more. It's the same Jesus you ever get. Because it's not the physical manifestation. It's the thought and thinking. It's the faith. So no matter how you turn Jesus Christ round, twist it round, and I try to make Jesus black. In your mind, the manifestation of that Jesus Christ in your mind is based upon a European thinking. Simple. So you don't have to live no certain way where you start to believe that. You don't have to, you don't have to express nothing in the culture. Mark your whole man will lamp on the herbs. Because the herbs now become almost like an addiction. So that part of the culture, it will still maintain. So you find that most men who read the Bible and all of them still all smoke all them herbs. But that is as far as the cultural expression will go. So the thing about Rastafari is a way of life. What is the way of life that Rasta was talking about 
or is talking about when them say Rasta is not a religion, but Rasta is a way of life. It must be an expression of culture. It must be an expression of culture. It must be an expression of how you talk, how you eat, how you walk, how you dress, how you look. So someone has said, boy, right now, I'm a Rasta, but I'm not for sure. You're not for sure, say, you're a Rasta. You're a article Rasta. So you have all men and people now who are no Rasta at all, who want Mac Rasta, come tell you, say, me a Rasta, you know. Me, it, it in my heart. Pluck out your heart and see if he's a Rasta, you know, because Rasta can't print, Rasta no print by your heart. Rasta no print by your heart. When a man say, you do have to dread to be a Rasta, all right? So if you do have to be dread to be a Rasta, what else is there that can define a Rasta? Yes, Eilis Selassie is the almighty God. Jesus Christ in his kingly character. That is the sound we go out there. And that is it. Well, if Rasta is only saying that, Bridget, I better go turn a Christian. I better be a Christian. Because... Oh, me the seat. Oh, me still a still seat. It's a liberty. It's a liberty. So you see, I'll bridge them like a man to go be here in a them village you now. And you see them in a them crocos. And them design the crocos in a certain way. And we know, see, that's where I come from. So we move forward now. You see, that we just wrap the crocos around you now. We go to a tailor and make the crocos into something fashionable. But what? It's a modern way of expressing our cultural divinity. So we draw off a right hand food and we put it in a calabash with a wooden spoon or a wooden fork or a two stick like Chinese. And we say that is a liberty. He said that's not important. That's very important in a rasta. Just like how man uses say food not important in a rasta. And that me come come say. I mean, not change that. No care where a man wants to say. Kentucky and no rasta business. All we hear a man talk about. Red stripe beer and guineas and rum and red bull and all them things. And a rasta business that. A man can't come tell me, say, yeah, but right now, I know a whole heap of man we no drink at all still. Do, watch a man. We don't talk about the man them who no drink it and not do that. You know, we are talking about the culture. The cultural expression of Rastafari. Yeah, yeah, and that yeah. Juice. And that may I say. The cultural expression of Rastafari are dreadlocks. The cultural expression. I don't care how much gay guys want locks, gay girls want locks. That don't negate the fact that the cultural expression, the most visible cultural expression of Rastafari is a dreadlocks. Non apologetically, we have said that. And that we evolve into when we start the Eilis Elasi the first, in the liberty, not in the the faith or the what we call the reading about it to define it. Because you can't read about Rastafari and come define Rastafari in the reading of it. That is just where educated, our educated person I could say. He said, where I write now, him read, say, see the revelation, this and this and this and that and that. That is nice. That is beautiful. But when you leave it to them now, because we look upon all the sister them. And we are saying, Wow. He a bridging car last week and I talk about Jack in Tantai or I'm bridging. My bridging sing about Jack in Tantai. I know a pure Jack in Tantai. <laughs> it was funny. It's funny. It's really, really funny. You know what I'm saying? But you are know, you can't go look at him and tell him nothing about that. Because I must say, boy, you must go tell him where right now. And the Jack in Tantai make him rasta. And the, the, the lock of Jack in Tantai. But you see, it's not the part of lack of or not make your rasta we are talking about. we are talking about what define rasta in this space that is what we call 
farmer slave plantation island that allow rasta to rise up themselves and become unique in this society and what it is or what it was is the cultural expression we can't let go that bridge and citrine we can't let it go look how much computer we are use look how much car we are drive look how much big house we are living at we have to know say it's the cultural expression of rastafari that make rastafari they were rastafari there to the point of when you look at a, a, a white man where they are firing, when you go to them reggae concert and you see a white man and them locks go weird on the bottom, how come a white man will manifest that expression? That, that serious dreadlocks expression. He will manifest it because, wow, it fascinates him. Ball it no fascinate nobody <laughs> really and truly. <laughs> ball it no fascinate nobody to, to be truthful. A man who ball it and a man who dreadlock. I would not tell what a man at the boat to boy right now. Yes, but Muta go like say, true, you have a long locks to make you righteous. No, we don't know righteousness at all. No. We are dealing with cultural expression. It's not no righteousness we are dealing with now because you have people who baptize and him not righteous but that don't mean say as a christian you're not for baptize so we are say you have rasta who have him locks got sold on him foot yet still him do things where man that say well a man you know rasta you know we call him lock, locks long but you know that we are talking about now we are talking about what define rastafari in this space known as culture are we giving up the cultural expression of rastafari for just a faith just believe it just believe something like Christian will say, all you have to do is believe. And we that say, we not believe, we know. And them things they define Rasta, you know, because Rasta say, we not believe, we know. But now we are a belief system. It's a belief system that have flow amongst ones and ones. That a daughter, I'll tell you now, say, boy, right now, I free, she free from the bandage of long dress and all these things. <laughs> yeah, so that's the reason that we say, so you just throw your long dress. Yeah, man, I mean, I mean, no bandage with no long dress, you know. You know, see it. So right away, right away, them did that see the culture as bandage. So is 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 article rasta a work the thing now? That not different from nothing else. Can you see a man face, but you don't see him art because him art is him art and him tart is him tart. You see a man face, you don't see him art. It's, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird, I find it weird and strange that Rasta is now saying that is not the manifestation of them culture that define them, but it's where them having a them art that define them. And Rasta did come not only with the article thing, but with a manifestation. Me don't know. So planners say we need a new faculty of interpretation. And where the man say you can be modern but not western. So with all the with all the computer and the and the um the car them where we are drive and the big bike them and all them thing there. There is a certain roots. Rastafari roots. I talk about just singing reggae now. So I sing just singing reggae now. We won't really call that Rasta culture. Rasta use that to express them culture. You know, but simple little things, simple little things, simple little things, as we are saying. Calabash, coconut, you know, they are the simple little things, you know. Bamboo, simple little things that define Rastafari. And those simple little things is what make the thing get big. That we are saying. Uh, the simple little things make it get big. Some man read out all of the Bible and he must say, boy, right now, chapter D, keep the devil away. <laughs> no, we don't say chapter D, can't keep the devil away. Because we see people are Christian read the Bible and run up here. So when they want to run up here, they just read Psalms. So 
in a feed him thinking a chapter I'd be a keep the devil away. But I know the devil we had to work with us or now. We had deal with a culture expression. Like what the British talk about the Yoruba tradition. The Yoruba tradition is a cultural expression. You can see it. Physically. Is the evidence. You see the evidence of this thing that it exists. It don't just exist in our man thinking. Unless you agree with the Christian, then when you say, why is he thinking? I got saved and not you. It's a serious thing. This is the cutting edge on RFM. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, blessed. Yeah, good night. Good night, sir. Um, you remember last week we talked to you about a Rasta man. We want to share a story with you. Yeah, you got, you got to tell me about him we tonight. Have yeah, eh? you got to tell me about him tonight, though. Yeah. Mm. Because he said sometimes we wait too long. And that's why they say the graveyard is one of the richest places. Because mm. sometimes we have a thing to share and we wait just too long. Mm. So, since we're about learning and discovering, we well, want to add something to the thing. All right. All right, this Rasta man, we know him from long, long, long time. He go way back from Carol Garden days. Mm. The man that used to have to run to the hills to hide from the police, hiding out, school tank and things, to get away yeah. from the police. Yeah. So, we have an intimate knowledge of with this man. Yeah. Now, when I sit on the bed with the man I read and say it was good to pass through in this time with certain and certain man. When the man passed, the second day in the night, the man came to me in a vision. The vision was in like two phases. One phase is the man show me him coming over in a waterfall. It's like waterfall was coming from in the clouds, in the heaven. He was more mightier than the Niagara Falls. In the next part of the, in the next phase of the vision, he showed me himself as a young man, like in the 1930s, moving from the physical into the invisible realm. When I wake up out of the dream, the man was in my room. How do you explain a man who never traveled from Jamaica, come to America, and, you know, you smell him? Because when you are dying from cancer, they're coming from you, a kind of smell that when your body breaking down, it produces that smell. I smell the smell inside my room. Now, there's a lot of things we can get out of this vision. In this video, I'm going to see where he addressed the issue of fear, limitation, and doubt. Right? And since me have other intuition to put everything together, I may apply study. You got to go to our book, Journey of Souls, to know and understand all about us, why things the way they are. Why are we on this journey? Why it's so complicated? Why it's so difficult? We are here building character, going through tests, trials, all kind of things. It's a long journey because in order for you to sit on the throne, you can't sit on it with just theory. You have to get a knowledge, data, hard data. So we are here experiencing it from all different form of nature expression. As low as it is, we are coming up, experiencing, gathering data. I, I talk about before how we spend 200 lifetime on the lower levels, coming up, gathering data, information. We spend another 500 lifetime on the next level, coming on up from uh, the animals, the man himself, then another 100 lifetime on the mental levels, learning things about our father's creation. Oh, man, I'm telling you. There is, when we pass, 
we go to other planets and we go in training to use your mental faculties to create life, to create planets. You are there, not alone. Your guide, your, your, your teacher, your master teacher is right there watching, observing you, creating rocks. You're using your energy with conscious projection, applying conviction. Everything, you are there in training, man. You see? This is the knowledge we have to pass on to our people and break this thing up about religion, all of that. That's the only way you're going to free yourself. Apply study. Every time I call, I say, apply study. You cannot be seated in this instrument and feel to apply yourself to study, high study. These books were the Maccabee and the six of them books of Moses. These books are soft. Man, I'm telling you, black man, you got to do this. No man is going to come and wave the magic wand and change your condition. Every man has to apply himself to deep study of yourself, your father's creation. Muda, give thanks. Yeah, man. Blessed man. Give thanks, man. Yeah. Yes, the brethren appeal to the soul of black folks to recognize self. If you have no confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in the race of life. But with confidence, you have won even before you have started. So we'll continue where we start last week, or where we end last week. And continue the journey. Yeah. The God we know, the God of the Western world, the God of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam has a history. Modern evidence indicates that if you read the Bible as it is currently presented by modern religion, especially if you are reading an English translation, you aren't reading the real story. What you are reading is an edited version of that history with additions and modifications that present that story in a different way than the evidence indicates it actually happened. According to the Bible, this God has always existed, and this God predated not only human beings, but the universe itself. According to the evidence, this God began evolving from human ideas originating from 14,000 years ago, and didn't become the one God of monotheism until 2,600 years ago, in 600 BCE. If you want to know the story that the evidence presents, the story understood and supported by the majority of religious studies professors, archaeologists, and anthropologists, the place to begin is not the Bible. It is the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation story, which was discovered by archaeologists in the library of Ashurbanipal and dated to have originally been written in about 1750 BCE. As this creation story demonstrates, almost all religions in Mesopotamia at that time were polytheistic. There is no trace of the existence of monotheistic Judaism at this time. In the Enuma Elish, Marduk, champion of the Babylonian gods, defeats chaos in the form of the dragon Tiamat, and then together, the Babylonian gods form the world. In the Babylonian story, the primordial world is described as formless and void. Also in the Babylonian story, light, the firmament, dry land, the sun and moon, and mankind are created in order. These details are important because, as we will see, 1,150 years later, when the Israelites are exiled to Babylon, these details become edited into both the book of Isaiah and the story of Genesis as its first chapter, the first chapter of the entire Hebrew Torah and Christian Bible. Our next point of interest is the Canaanite religion, which archaeologists have reconstructed from clay tablets found in Ugra, an ancient port city in Syria, and whose stories are dated to have originally been written before 1200 BCE. The Canaanites were also polytheistic. Of the many gods the Canaanites worship, three in particular are important to the rest of the story. They are El Elyon, whose name means literally God Most High and who is believed to have been the father of the other gods, Ashira, El Elyon's wife, and Bel, who is both god of storms and fertility, the god Yahweh of Israel 
and the culture of Israel itself still show no signs of existence in the archaeological record. Yet sometime over the next 500 years, the culture of Israel must have evolved, because it is at this time, from 950 to 850 BCE, that the contemporaries J and E began writing their independent accounts of the history of the people of Israel, which would later be combined into a single story. Beginning in Genesis chapter 2, none of what J or E writes aligns with the accounts of the Babylonians or Canaanites, whose accounts predated them by hundreds of years. Because of this, and because of the nature of the stories told, the most reasonable inference appears to be that these accounts were entirely mythical stories that the Israelites used to explain the world around them and find meaning in its cultural climate. But that all changes at Genesis chapter 12 with the story of Abraham. It is here that we finally find a connection with the religion of the Canaanites. We can see in the Hebrew version of the Torah that Abraham is said to worship El Shaddai, one of the names for the Canaanite god El Elyon. Abraham interacts with El Elyon in very personal ways that mirror the other pagan religions of the time. For example, in Genesis 18, El Elyon visits Abraham in human form and talks to him in person. His descendant Jacob has similar experiences where he climbs to the top of a ladder to heaven and talks to El Elyon in a dream. Later, Jacob wrestles with El Elyon. Also from the Hebrew text, we can see that based on these experiences, Jacob makes El Elyon his Elohim, which is a term from the Canaanite religion, which meant Jacob was making El Elyon his primary god. The only way that the usage of this term makes sense is if Jacob believed that El Elyon was just one god of many, and that Jacob was committing to this one god in order to receive special protection. In other words, it becomes clear from the terms used in the God they worshipped that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were polytheists or pagans, just like their pagan contemporaries in Canaan and Babylon. The worship of El Elyon fades from the Hebrew text as we enter Exodus, where he is replaced by Yahweh, who is said to have rescued the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt. The story of Exodus, particularly in its modern interpretation in the animated film, the Prince of Egypt depicts ancient Egyptians as the ultimate assholes, viciously enslaving an entire race for the sole purpose of erecting colossal monuments to their own glory. While it is a moving story of triumph and deliverance from oppressive circumstances, on a historical level, it contradicts the modern archaeological evidence that we have for the inner workings of ancient Egyptian culture, particularly their slave ownership practices. Modern archaeological evidence indicates that the workers who built all of the large monuments in Egypt, from pyramids to sphinxes, were well-paid Egyptian citizens who were given good housing, fed well, given good medical care, and given honorable burials. Further, while, like many ancient civilizations, the Egyptians did own some slaves, there's no evidence that they ever owned the magnitude purported by the Bible or otherwise systematically enslaved an entire race. While the account of Exodus appears to have been largely mythical, its telling nonetheless reveals the polytheistic worldviews of J and E. After the Hebrews are rescued by Yahweh from the Egyptians, we can see even in the English translations of Exodus that they sing, Who is like you among gods, Yahweh? And, Now I know that Yahweh is greater than all other gods. Exodus also established Yahweh as Israel's war god, calling him a great warrior who delivered them from Egypt. As the Torah progresses, its polytheistic nature compounds. After arriving in the Promised Land, no longer in need of help in war, but rather desiring to prosper in peace, the Israelites begin to worship once again the Canaanite fertility gods Baal and Asherah. Before reading A History of God, verses like this made no sense to me. In the English translation of the Bible, the Hebrews are presented as choosing between the Lord, Baal, and Asherah. How could the Hebrews be Why wouldn't they worship the one God of all creation, Asherah? How could the Hebrews be such idiots? Why wouldn't they worship the one God of all creation? The picture looks different when the God you're supposed to be worshiping is Yahweh, Sabaoth, which means the God of the armies. Yahweh started as basically the Hebrew version of the Greek god Ares. No wonder he was obsessed with war and death in the Old Testament. That was back when he was still just their god of war. Now the picture made sense. Like the ancient Greeks, the Hebrews had a pantheon of gods they worshipped, at least the gods Yahweh, Baal, and Asherah. 
We have archaeological evidence of the polytheistic nature of early Israelite culture. In one of our earliest archaeological artifacts from Israel, from 1000 BCE, a polytheistic cult stand from Tanakh. Despite their polytheism, there were among the Israelites some with an unusually strong devotion to Yahweh in particular, who are now referred to as Yahwehs. In times of peace, there was little motivation for the people of Israel to give much weight to the opinions of such radical devotees of Yahweh. But times of upheaval accelerated their opinions to the forefront of Hebrew culture. After the death of King Jeroboam II in about 750 BCE, the northern kingdom of Israel was in a state of near anarchy. On top of this, it was well known that Assyria wished to capture Israel in its moment of weakness. From this state of upheaval, three prophets arose, Isaiah, Amos, and Hosea. All three of them cried for devotion to Yahweh and disparaged the worship of other gods. From their prophecies, we can see how each of their versions of Yahweh had been created in their own image. Isaiah, a member of the royal family, had seen Yahweh as a king. Amos, a shepherd, had described his own empathy with the suffering poor to Yahweh. Hosea, who was suffering through marriage problems, saw Yahweh as a jilted husband who still continued to fill a yearning tenderness for his wife, Israel. Ultimately, their outcry did nothing to save the northern tribes, and they fell to Assyria in 711 BCE. But their words lived on in Hebrew scripture and the Hebrew imagination. The cult of Yahweh received another boost during the rule of King Josiah in 622 BCE. Unlike his predecessors, who welcomed an open pagan vision, Josiah was a strict Yahwist. Like the prophets before him, Josiah was convinced that Judah's social problems came from a lack of devotion to Yahweh. During renovations to the temple, Josiah's high priest Hokiah discovered a lost book of the law, which was alleged to have been authored by Moses. This book was Deuteronomy, and given its conveniently timely discovery, as well as its linguistic features, the majority consensus of biblical scholars such as Richard Elliot Friedman is that it was a forgery. In Deuteronomy, a strict and permanent covenant to Yahweh, as well as a complete rejection of other gods is established. It is commanded of the Hebrews that they tear down the altars and smash the idols of other gods. In response to the discovery of Deuteronomy, Josiah and his court implemented merciless reforms that officially established Yahweh as the official God of Judah. The reformers also rewrote Israelite history. The historical books of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings were revised according to the new ideology. And later, the editors of the Pentateuch added passages that gave a Deuteronomist interpretation of the Exodus myth to the older narratives of J and E. The intense hatred of other gods by Yahweh is firmly established in the rewritten Hebrew history. The bloody god Yahweh is made even bloodier, as he is now said to have commanded Joshua to wreak genocide on the natives of Canaan for worshipping other gods. Interestingly, despite the enforcement of this strict devotion to Yahweh, monotheism was still not established. The evidence of Deuteronomist passages like, You shall have no other gods before me, indicates that even Josiah still believed in the existence of other gods. This was still polytheism. It was just a vicious form of monolaterous polytheism that vehemently rejected the worship of the other gods. But the stage was set. In 604 BCE, King Nebuchadnezzar II rose to power in Babylon. It was well known at this time that Nebuchadnezzar sought to conquer Jerusalem. As his armies gathered and prepared, another prophet, Jeremiah, arose, once again crying that strict devotion to Yahweh and the rejection of other gods had been the solution to their problems. Except this new prophet was claiming that it was too late to do anything about it. Yahweh would use this foreign army as his instrument to teach his people a damning lesson. Like the prophets before him, he projected his own emotions, such as fury, onto Yahweh. As Jeremiah predicted, the fall of Jerusalem to Babylon was inevitable. The forces of Babylon were just too massive, and Jerusalem was just in too weak a state. The temple was destroyed. The Hebrews were exiled from their country to live in Babylon. The Babylonian exile had begun. Their sense of defeat was devastating. Polytheistic gods in ancient Mesopotamia were associated with specific territories of land. When the Hebrews were exiled to Babylon, they felt they could no longer connect with Yahweh. How can we sing the songs of Yahweh while in a foreign land? Ezekiel, a prophet who arose among the exiled Hebrews, expressed how alienated the Hebrews had become. He too blamed their plight 
on the Hebrew people for a lack of devotion to Yahweh. It was then, at a time when the Hebrew people seemed most crushed, at a time when it seemed certain that the cult of Yahweh would surely die, it instead did something that religion has done throughout history in order to survive. It changed. A new author, whose scholars call Second Isaiah, arose, and his words were appended to those of the first Isaiah. I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Monotheism was born. From this new monotheistic culture, the priestly source P arises. Israelite history is rewritten once again. Exodus is rewritten by P to say that the El Shaddai worshipped by Abraham and the Yahweh worshipped by Moses were the same God. Any references to El Elyon are explained by P as merely different names for Yahweh. The entire book of Leviticus is authored. Genesis 1 is crafted as an improved monotheistic version of the Babylonian account of creation. Second Isaiah rewrites Babylonian myths that were attributed to Marduk, such as his defeat of the dragon Tiamat, attributing them instead to Yahweh. The Torah is rebranded by P to look as if it had always been monotheistic. In 600 BCE, the god of Western monotheism, the god of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, was born. Once I knew this, my entire perception of the Bible changed once again. Verses that never made sense before made sense now. This was the death blow of monotheism for me. It was the revelation that I could pick up any one of the millions of Bibles in America, from hotel rooms to Christian gift shops, and see its pages dripping with polytheism. I could see, with my own eyes, human beings giving birth to the monotheistic God. So, who I explain monotheism and polytheism, you know, as people say, polytheism, Pali is, is, is many. So when you hear the man talk about polytheism, he's talking about a society with many gods. Pali is many. I think it's Greek, Pali. So when you hear the word Pali, theism, it's a talk about a society that gives credence to many gods and many deities. Monotheism is the opposite, where it it gives credence to one God. So that is where the man talk about. So we continue the journey and keep talking. As I continued reading about the P generation's contributions to the concept of God, I finally began to see some similarities with the form of theism I had been taught and believed as a Christian. According to P, God was beyond the comprehension of human beings. The full reality of God would always elude our understanding. Rather, only the manifestation of God could be seen. The glory of Yahweh. This conception of the theistic God was further developed by the Greek Jew Philo of Alexandria in 30 BCE. According to Philo, God's essence was unknowable and shrouded in impenetrable mystery. The only way we knew him was through his powers, which he used to interact with our world. God used his powers to communicate with us because our limited intellect could not comprehend his essence. His powers allowed us to catch a glimpse of a reality that is beyond anything we can conceive. I had abandoned even this more mysterious conception of the theistic God for many reasons which I had solidified after my deconversion, not least of which was because the evidence indicated that this type of theistic God was generated directly from the ideas of polytheism. But it was nice to see a conception of God that was closer to the ground of all being of panentheism, which I now felt was possibly the true form of God. I had encountered a possible expression of the God of panentheism in the Vedic concept of Brahman earlier in the history of God. Brahman was seen as the power that sustains everything. The whole world was the divine activity welling up from the mysterious being of Brahman, which was the inner meaning of all existence. The Vedic Upanishads encouraged people to cultivate a sense of Brahman in all things. Doing so was the unveiling of the hidden ground of all being, and the perception of unity beyond different phenomena. Brahman was not a deity to be thanked or feared by mankind. It was something to be experienced. As I read on, I saw that the Jews themselves began conceptualizing God in very similar ways to Brahman, cultivating God's presence in the smallest details of their daily life. 
This was the vision of Jews like Rabbi Hillel, the elder, in 70 CE. Yet the consistency of these seemingly unified images of God started to break down as I thought about them. What did it mean that God was the ground of all being? Is God the world we see, or something beyond what we see? Did reality emanate from God, or was God reality itself? Was God the creative forces of the universe, or the basic laws upon which those forces were based? Did God live through human beings, or was God a reality outside of human beings? Was God simply everything, or was God something specific that we were seeking after? Was God the grounding that made our actions possible, or was God the energy with which we acted? All of these conceptions of a non-theistic God were different, and they all meant different things. What I was slowly starting to realize, as Armstrong exhibited more and more conceptions of God that had been expressed through the centuries, was that maybe God was just what we called things that we don't understand. Or maybe God was what we called powerful emotions we had. In describing God, perhaps what we were really describing were not things outside of us, but our own psychology, our connection to other people, our sense of wonder about the things in the world that we do understand our sense of mystery about the things in the world that we don't understand. All these things had been called God, yet they all represented something distinctly different about physical reality. And saying that it is all God, that everything is God, is profound in its own way, but saying that also diminishes the special quality of each individual perspective. Again, perhaps what we were labeling as God was not the things outside of us, but the feelings we have when we experience these things, our own psychology. Even the first century Jews who studied under Rabbi Yohanan seemed to grasp this fact subconsciously. As they developed the concept of God, they stopped doctrinally forcing a specific theology and instead established theology as a private matter, subjective to each person. But as my introspection had revealed, the concept of God was not only subjective between different individuals, but also subjective within the same individual from moment to moment. In one moment, God meant to me my connection to other people. In another, God meant the awe-inspiring laws of the universe. In yet another, God meant the awe-inspiring expression of the universe itself. Maybe God was not a thing. Maybe God was a feeling. Maybe God was an experience. Maybe God was an expression of our psychology. This was a disconcerting possibility for me to consider at first. Reaching out to some kind of ultimate reality outside of myself had always been an important part of my identity, and still is to this day. At first, I thought that letting go of a belief in a single, unifying quality of reality that could be called God meant letting go of that commitment to reach outside of myself and connect with a greater reality. In fact, letting go of using the word God was something I couldn't accept at first, and I scrambled to somehow make sense of it instead of letting it go. After tolerating a few more chapters of Armstrong's exposition of several more subjective historical iterations of the concept of God, I became frustrated and flipped to the last chapter of the book. What the hell was God in the modern world? I found Armstrong's answer less than satisfying. Her final chapter basically ended with her sorting through the many subjective historical conceptions of God to find the right fit for the modern age. Which God concept could work for us? But how could something that could be selected so subjectively, like we were shopping for the right pair of shoes or a good book to read, be thought of as the ultimate pinnacle of all reality? No. There was a creeping problem with all this reasoning about God. A creeping problem that had started to slowly but steadily crystallize as I read the theological reasoning of people like John Shelby Spahn, Karen Armstrong, and religious thinkers throughout history. And that problem was evidence. None of these conceptions of God were motivated by verifiable and binding evidence. And without evidence, we might as well be debating about how many angels could fit on the head of a pin, or the best strategy Frodo Baggins could use to get the ring to Mordor. The theological thought process was contained entirely within our own minds and our own feelings. 
with no grounding in physical reality. This realization of a lack of grounding in evidence was a problem not only for theism, but for every conception of God, including panentheism and pantheism. If God was just a name that we gave things that we do have evidence for, then using the term God to describe them is meaningless and unhelpful because of the theological baggage the term carries. If we call the natural universe God, we risk implying that it has theistic properties when that isn't what we mean. This was one of Einstein's greatest mistakes as a de facto atheist, one that still annoys atheists today as theists exuberantly claim him as a believer. But if God is meant to refer to something that is beyond our understanding, like something powerful and intelligent that preceded the universe, or a grounding of our perceived reality that we cannot fully understand, or a universal consciousness that benevolently guides all things, then another problem occurs. By the very nature of these claims, we have no evidence for them. Either way, as I thought about it over the next several months, I could not justify using the term God to describe any aspect of reality any longer. Again, perhaps God was just what we called things that made us feel a certain way. Perhaps ultimately, the best way to think of God was as a feeling we experience, a part of our own psychology. How was it that it was so hard for people to agree on what God was, yet so easy for them to agree that there was a God? Because God is a feeling, a feeling of the ultimate and the numinous. A feeling that all people share and experience. Not a thing, but a feeling that we use to label our experiences, often the most meaningful experiences of our lives. And a lot of things throughout history had made people have this feeling. So a lot of things throughout history had been called God, or called evidence of God. The explanation made a lot of sense. As I continued my journey over the next several years, I began to solidify my currently vague grasp on the principles of evidence and reason that had spontaneously led me to this conclusion. In fact, I began to solidify my grasp on a number of relevant scientific principles as well. Without even realizing what I was doing, I began to embark on a mental boot camp that would transform the way I perceive and think about the world. Thought-provoking, always smoking, lyrics like a bazooka, you are listening to Muta Baruka. Continent! Yeah, the man I talk about God, not not Sisla, but the, the, the talk, you know, we just play on the concept of God. And if you if you really read about the Buddhism, you realize, say, the Buddhists, they don't have no problem with God. They just not deal with it. You understand? It kind of hurt me sometimes when I hear people that talk about, oh, Buddhist, God is Buddha. You know, like him worship Buddha. Buddhists no worship God. You understand? It's not part of the thing. You understand? It's, it's an enlightenment. And it's that we search for continuously. Enlightenment. We need some light for really shine in our consciousness, in our being. For make we see life. You know, there's a word named animism. Animism. You hear the Yoruba man just talk about it a while ago where close to nature, the stone, the birds, the bees, the flowers, the trees, everything. We are not separate, but we are a part of everything in nature. We are part of nature. We are not separate from nature. What we are trying to know is separate ourselves from nature. That's why we treat Nature so cruel, and then cruel actions, you have a reaction. So when you start to treat nature cruelly, nature reacts with cruelty. 
So, and the problem with it is that nature don't have a concept of cruelty. <laughs> you understand? There's no concept of cruelty in nature. All that concept is coming from man's mind. But you put in and you get out. What you put in is what you get out. You understand? This hour that they call Holy Thursday, it was that time I reached Barnet, 14 Barnet Street. When I reached there, Bustamante start to gather soldiers and police in a Abundant to search for Rasta. When I reach the station, I see a bulk of people. Rasta, and who is not Rasta, is there. Beating is going on from all anger. Mm. They have a long was that they turn on, use and to water the place there. Mm -hmm. So it have a piece of high and down here, and it have a piece up here where it's going on the, the pipe. So, them turn on the pipe now, and the water running through the woods. And them put us down, to kneel down, in that gutter way, and start to beat. With the hose? Yes, with the hose and big stick, and all different type of so lick. What, so, they turn on, what are they doing with the water? The, when, they, when them lick you, and the blood start flow, them, them turn oh. on the water, and wash with the blood. What a wicked act. At that time now, Bustamante never come down. Thursday now, Friday morning, which is the time of crucifixion, was the man to come down. The good Friday for them and the bad Friday. Yes, and the bad Friday for yes. her. Yeah. Was the man to come down now with a battalion of police, more police more than soldier, and them start to beat. And them have a... a the beating in front of Buster now? Right Buster, in Buster front, witnessing, right in front the prime of, minister witnessing the beating? Right in front of Buster Monty. Who they beating? Please. Just, just any, everybody that get beaten? Everybody who is inside getting beaten. You have nine cells run by 14 Barney Street. And from the first one to the ninth, it's packed with people. And people still coming in. So as you come in, you start to get beaten from both sides. Soldier here, police here. Who no butt you, box you. Who no kick you. Them do every type of thing to us at that time. Buster Monty was there. And he said to them, say, beat them. Beat them and let them say Rasta fall and Babylon stand. And if I don't kill out Rasta out of Jamaica, God forbid me. So you heard when Buster said that? I heard that with my ears, Sister Angela. Bongo Frank, you heard that with your ears? I hear? heard that with I my ears. I'm asking this Bongo Frank because we hear this all the while. I and at first, we are talking to somebody who actually hear it with them. I heard ears. that with my ears, yes. Empress Angela. Tell us what I'm saying again. Buster Monty. Tell us what the Prime Minister said. Buster Monty is the Prime Minister. He has on a cream serge pants, a striped blue shirt with white background. He has on a red, a black water boot, and the bottom of it red. He had a 22 in his side. And him said to, to the police them, anywhere you see one or two, bring them in, dead or alive. And what? 14 Barney Street cannot hold. Borg will hold them. And Borg is a cemetery. Yes, ma'am. So, while we were there now, I witnessed the cell that I was at, number one cell. 35 persons in one cell. You cannot lay down, you cannot sit up. You have to stand on one foot, and when that foot tired, you stand on the other one. 35 persons. 35 persons in one cell. And that cell can't hold about how much people? It can't hold more than about 20. Or, uh, it's, 35. So you have to stand up one anyone. foot at a time. And How long you stand up like that in a cell? No, you can't stand up no long time, you know. So you have to stand on the foot and ease it, and stand on the foot and ease it. The man who sit down, if he get up, he can't go back at that space. The man who stand up, and if he try to get a seat, he can't find by the same space where part him come from. What's the man to take us out? And he tried to transfer us from... 14 Barney Street to Anuva, the barrack prison. I was there for three months without trial. 
and beaten in every one of the stations that you go to. No mercy, never sure, to Rasta at that time. Buster Monty look upon the people and say, Buster say, if him don't kill out the Rasta people and Ganja out of Jamaica, God was blind him. So that time now, we were, the massacre was too terrible to talk about. For there was no one who don't feel pain. If you have the smallest piece of beard, you're going to get a bean. And if you're going to a barber shop and you are not a rasta, you're going to a barber shop and come out and the policeman see you and say, say you just trim. You're going into jail. Mm. I'm saying you go and trip to hide yourself. So at that time, Empress Andrea, we were... I can't tell you this time, for it hurts so much that mm. I feel it in mm. all my heart. I see it on you, my brother. I feel I it see in it all you, my, my heart. Father. I see it on you, my father. It's a judgment oh, upon the land. Fireman. Oh, my God. The big man, a ball man. Look here, man. Fire I. Blessed be the God of Jacob. Oh. Who live forever and forever. What so a last Back a case. Yes, we know maybe I sleep now. We're supposed to play a tune, you know, but it comes like so we left the CD. So, <laughs> so we're gonna see if we can work it out tomorrow. I mean today, a little more. But why you look know, back a case celebrating birthday? Yes, I'm an old schoolmate from a longer time. Yes, bigger man than me, but I'm a brethren. Remember, say we day again. From 2 to 5.45 with the Stepping Razor, the Art of War. Smoking. Lyrics like a bazooka. You are listening to the music. 